Chris, it's a, it's a pleasure to, to have you here at Temple Jeremiah, and thank you to Fan and to Lonnie and to Mitch Slatnick and the Winnetka Interfaith Council for uh, co-sponsoring along with all of the Fan sponsors this, this evening. Um, full disclosure, I am not an interviewer. <laughs> this is just my third opportunity, and you are the first person that I've interviewed who does this for a living. <laughs> I'm given comfort and pause by what you wrote about generous listening. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that as a rabbi, a husband, a father, and a friend, I try to practice in every moment of every day. However, you also lay down quite a challenge when you wrote, I measure the strength of a question now in the honesty and eloquence it elicits. <laughs> so I'm going to do my best. <laughs> So I, I, want you, I want to give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit about the book. Why a book on becoming wise, mm. an inquiry into the mystery and art of living. And really, how does this reflect the learning that you have gained through your years of interviewing, your years of conversation? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I want to say that I'm so happy to be in Chicago to begin my tour. And I'm so happy to be here. And I do believe that rabbis have superpowers. <laughs> so I'm sure you'll be a great interviewer. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, well, it's interesting. I didn't set out to write a book on becoming wise, and I didn't actually name the book until almost till it was almost written. Um, I I was following this question that has been asked to me uh, for since the beginning. Uh, people want to know what are recurring qualities of wise lives. Like you've met all these wise people. What do they have in common? What, what, can you, what can you teach us from that? And so that's what I started tracing. Um, and actually, when I sent in the uh, near, one of the near final drafts to my editor, I called it No Name Manuscript. <laughs> but, but then, I mean, I do think a book is kind of like a child. Yeah. And I think, yes, we can name our children in advance, but sometimes you look at a baby and you, it has another name. And so I was like, I mean, I looked at this baby and. And I, I realized that it was called Becoming Wise. And then I went back and found that that was woven all, I mean, that very language was woven all through. I, I will say that the word becoming is just as important as the word wise. It's not a destination. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, as I say, it was almost done. And then when I had named it and realized that that, in fact, was the connective tissue, then it then it really came together. And you use the, the subtitle, Mystery and Art of The Mystery of and Living. Art of Living, And yeah. what do you see as the relationship between mystery and art? Oh, well, you know, I, I, we did this show about Einstein years ago, and, and I, I did that book, which started with my conversations about Einstein. And so I suppose, um, you know, he put those two words together. And he, you know, he said that a sense of wonder, a reverence for mystery, is at the heart of the both, at the, at the best of science and religion and the arts. I also think of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who told young people to, to treat your life as a work of art. And I would say that although everybody doesn't use that language, that is one of the messages that's come through loud and clear. Um, yeah. Right. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the structure of the book is also of great interest. Um, you chose to write within a set of five areas, although looking back at a previous interview, that also came a little bit later on as you were thinking about the structure of the book, that many different chapters and yes. different chapter headings. And you chose to write within a set of these five areas that you describe really as the raw materials. Yes. Um, and those five are words, flesh, love, faith, and hope. Tell me a little bit about how that came to be, how that percolated to the surface for you. Yeah, so, so in that beginning, as the book was taking shape, um, I imagine that there would be 10 or 11 chapters. And some of them had very flowery, poetic titles. Um, but as I really was able to write the book, um, I think what's so important to me is that we not put wisdom up on a pedestal. And, you know, Einstein, again, spoke of spiritual genius, that there's, there's such a thing in the world as spiritual genius, 
um, he was talking about Gandhi, his contemporary, um, and he said, you know, the, the, the dignity, security, and joy of humanity needs both kinds of intelligence. Um, but I talk about, you know, the, the way I've come to think about this is spiritual, there are the spiritual geniuses of the ages, the people we can all, you know, who come to mind, the Gandhi, the Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King Jr., you know, a Heschel. Um, but there are also the spiritual geniuses of the everyday, and they are everywhere. And as I, as I, as I continued to write the book, it, it, it just became so pressing for me to illuminate wisdom as I've seen it, as something that is accessible to all of us, and that in fact emerges through the raw materials of our lives, and the raw materials of the everyday, of ordinary experience. And so, again, as the book kind of came together, um, it was clear to me that, you know, it had to be these, these the, the organization had to be very elemental. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the words, our bodies, our physical, the physicality of us and of the world around us, um, love, faith, and hope, I think are, are elements um, that we all inhabit and that we can inhabit more consciously. And that you didn't list them hierarchically. That it seemed to me that there was a great interplay yeah. amongst all five throughout each of the five sections. Yes, that's right. That's right. Um, what, what to you was the most surprising aspect of, of this project? That's a good question. I should get ready yes. for that one, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Good question. Um, oh, it was very hard. I should say before I keep going, I actually got, I actually kind of crossed the threshold where I could finish the book at Ragdale writing, Writers Retreat. I think there may be some people here from Ragdale tonight, and there they are, um, which is right up the road, right? And we're close. Uh, it was very hard, it was very painful. And so I think what was hard, just to speak on a personal level, is um, I, uh, when I am in conversation, and you know, my ideas uh, these last 13 years have developed conversationally. Uh, and I'm present, but I'm also not at the center. Mm -hmm. you know? I get out of the way, in a sense. Right. To the ex I mean, I'm, I'm present, and, and to the extent that I'm sharing, uh, it's, it's, all, it's all part of creating a hospitable space and drawing out what mm -hmm. this other person has to say. Um, so I, and it literally took years to, fit, to get the voice right. Yeah. Um, and my inclination in the early years was to write about other people. Um, and that is precisely what I don't let my conversations and partners do. I don't let them talk about that or about them. Um, uh, uh, for, you know, for many reasons, but partly because it's not listenable, it's not interesting. What's, right. what's interesting is when uh, people will speak at the intersection of what they know, what they see, and who they are. You know, their, their ideas and their experience, and the merger of those two things. So, I had to realize at some point that I had to do that too. Right. And it didn't come naturally. Um, and so, uh, the book had kind of many messy chapters. Um, and then, I guess one of the most interesting things that happened is, uh, uh, you know, this, this first question, I, I, I talk about, you know, I talk about things I've learned. Um, and I realized, um, although I'm drawing wisdom from other people, um, I am the connective tissue between, because these, these conversations I have all come into conversation inside my head. Right. Um, but, but it's also that I, I'm, then I'm, I'm, I'm present, so I had to take that seriously and write about that. Um, you know, I, 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 I describe and anybody who listens to the show knows that I have this opening question, um, which I find to be a magical question. Uh, to, I ask anybody, whoever they are, religious or non-religious, you know, well, tell me about the spiritual background of your childhood. The longer I've done this, um, I've had a much, you know, more and more expansive understanding of what the spiritual background of a childhood is. It may be a religious upbringing, um, and it's probably other things as well. And I've always talked about uh, my Southern Baptist preacher grandfather right. when I talk about the spiritual background of my childhood, and that's absolutely part of the answer. But I, I also realized um, 
that, uh, you know, what's moving for me is when people answer that question expansively. And I think the spiritual, our spiritual underpinnings are, are also uh, the questions we started to ask mm -hmm. about life that, that, you know, I think I find in, the, in childhood, I think uh, many people I've experienced start posing questions that they really end up following, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a very uh, nonlinear path. Um, I, and, and the spiritual background of our childhood has to do with uh, what was missing, uh, where, our, where our pain and confusion was, um, where our joy was. That's all about our spiritual life. So uh, I, at some point, realized that I hadn't been telling, I hadn't, I hadn't been giving a complete answer, and that, that there was also, um, that in, in the family I grew up in, uh, there were questions that couldn't be asked. Um, there were questions. My, my father had been adopted at a young age and um, I think had a very dark, he, he was, he's pretty damaged by that. And so there were these absolutely fundamental questions of identity, of who we are, of what our family was, of, of why there was this pain and loneliness in the midst of abundance. And that, uh, I, you know, I had this revelation that, uh, that I have then spent my life trying to say, yes, we are going to name the unaskable questions, and we're going to ask them in public and work on them together. And so that was actually a great gift of the writing you know, to me. But it, it took so long for me to figure that out. Right, right. And it's a process of discovery. Yeah. And, and I'm yeah. sure even now, as you're kind of reflecting back on that experience, it continues to unfold before you. Yes. And so, so let me ask you, give you that opportunity to ask, answer more fully that question of, of the spiritual background. What is the mm -hmm. spiritual background beyond your grandfather being a Baptist preacher yeah. um, and the setting of this? You talk about growing up in a place that people went to to run away from their past and from yes. their ancestral demons. Yes, that's and, right. And, and what does that, how does that play out now mm -hmm. for you? Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, I mean, Oklahoma is a place where people actually were fleeing, and they were often breaking the law to get in mm. and stealing territory from people who were living there. Um, when I moved to the west, to the East Coast, and I think it's true in Chicago as well, you know, you meet strangers, and one of the first questions they ask you is, where's your family from? Right. You know? And I never was asked that question growing up in Oklahoma, and no one has an answer, because it's, it, it, people are leaving history behind. And then in my family, because of my father's situation, um, you know, he was very intentionally like putting a wall between uh, him and us and history. Uh, it's, it's interesting, and again, this is like, you know, writing is kind of like a form of psychoanalysis, <laughs> self-psychoanalysis. You know, I ended up in divided Berlin in the 80s, most of my 20s, in a place where history was ever present in every room. And the demons were named constantly, and they were sitting on your shoulders. And I think that was, you know, I think I was drawn to that. Um, I think I appreciated that in a, in a funny way, although it was, you know, it was very, um, not always a happy thing, mm -hmm. but it was heavy and it was real. Right. And it was, it was letting in the complexity of humanity and of history. Thank you. Um, the, uh, another a statement that struck me in, as, as we were talking about virtues and your statement that virtues are the tools for the art of living. Um, you say the virtues and indeed rituals are spiritual technologies, and I, I love that phrase. It's wonderful, and this is, and part of it is because it's very in line with with what I'm currently very involved with in, in the Musar tradition in Judaism, mm. um, that talks about yes. the cultivation. Yes, I just of had a conversation with Tiffany Schlein about she uh -huh. started using Musar because she's doing all this work on character. Right, right, yes. and so to to think of this and and to um, how how you talk about this building of spiritual muscle memory. Yes. Um, also something that resonated for me as I tried to take up the guitar very late in life and guitarists would tell me, oh, it's all about the muscle memory in your, in your fingers. You just have to continue to, to work at it and work at it. And, yes. and I find the, the spiritual stuff much easier than the guitar playing. Uh, <laughs> much, it's, it's, 
you, you find you find um, developing character easier than learning to play the guitar. Yeah, it, in terms of the the, the spiritual muscle memory yeah. and and working on that and and understanding how it is that rituals yeah. and the performance of rituals yes. and how important that is on a consistent basis and yeah. to to so that it becomes a part of your your memory. It's something that yes. happens. And and this is where. We're on this a fascinating frontier in the 21st century where science is taking the wisdom, especially the ancient wisdom of our traditions, into the laboratory. Right. And I remember actually being with, uh, so, you know, I think that one of the most wonderful discoveries of our time, uh, of my lifetime, is, is this notion of neuroplasticity, mm -hmm. that we learn that our brains do not stop forming at some point in adolescence or young adulthood, that they can change across the lifetime, that we can change our brains through our behavior, yes. um, that we can, we can influence our, ge our genetics through our behavior. I mean, this, is, this is amazing, but it does, it does take practice. Um, I remember being with um, the chief rabbi, the former chief rabbi of the UK, Jonathan Sachs, and he yes. said, Neuroscience has now vindicated ritual, <laughs> because that is exactly. That's a very good impression of Lord <laughs> Jonathan Sachs. He's very, very regal He's in, in the his book. presentation. Well, that because that is exactly what our traditions understood, yes. and also what's so important to that image is that physical postures are more than physical. Mm -hmm. um, that there is an intelligence in the body. Yes. Um, and I think on a, to me it's very uh, practical, practically useful to say, um, yeah, I do think of virtues as spiritual technologies, and to say, um, because you know, one of the people who contributed to the discovery of neuroplasticity was this neuroscientist, Rich, Richie Davidson, who I hear has been here. Um, and he studied uh, the brains of, so he got this fax from the Dalai Lama one day in, in like 1994, I love that. Like, Facts you know, from the Dalai yes. Lama. And like today, would he get a text, you know, <laughs> an email? And the, and the Dalai Lama, who is a big believer in science, said, uh, we, in, our, in that tradition, we monastics, Tibetan monastics, um, have these contemplative practices. And he said, I believe that these change us, that they're not, I don't think he said this, but not merely spiritual that they change us, and I would like to test that hypothesis. So, uh, he, he, Richard Davidson is at the Brain Imaging Laboratory at Madison, and he brought these, what they called Olympic meditators. <laughs> in, and they, they attach electrodes to their brains. Um, and they found that indeed, yes, their brains were different. And this was one of the pieces of discovery that helped uh, open up this, this, this revelation of neuroplasticity. Yeah. Um, so one of the things Richard Davidson, like he believes, uh, and I believe, that uh, compassion, um, that we, that we, we are, um, we have the capacity, we are born we, we, with the capacity to be compassionate like we are born with the capacity for language. Um, but how do we learn language? We learn it by having, not by people teaching us actually, or telling us about it, but by people doing it around us. Right. And by doing it ourselves. And, you know, this idea that, I think we think of virtues, um, I, I think we, you know, we maybe think, you know, some people are more compassionate than others, some people are more kind, some people are more forgiving, more patient, or that's just not me, I just don't have that. And of course, none of us has all of those virtues. But they are things, and you know, the New Year's resolution doesn't do it. We all know that. Right. Um, but they are things we actually don't have to feel or be gifted with, but we can decide that we are going to develop that muscle memory. Right. It's as a habit. Yeah. And you know, what ritual does is, uh, the ritual also, uh, which is so important too, it, um, it 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 turns those ha it 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 um, honors those habits in communal space and time, right. and it also can create a container for us to be companions to each other as we strive to 
to be those things. And so I think you know, rituals pin aspiration to action, which mm -hmm. is one way I say it. Yeah, yeah, that's a beautiful, yeah, aspirations to action. Yeah. And I think actually in, in the Musar tradition, they would argue that, no, we do all possess those virtues and that part of our spiritual curriculum is to identify where the work needs to be done. Right. Um, and that we all have the capacity, as you said, for compassion. Some of us are able to tap into that and act on it more readily yeah. um, and more easily. And others, for others, it takes work and practice uh, to be able to do that. And it was interesting, you, you had an interview with an anthropologist whose name escapes me at, at the moment who talked about um, how he was concerned how things were identified by milestones um, versus conditions and that in looking at how um, Neanderthal communities circled around yes. the young, the, the most vulnerable, and yes. that this was something that hadn't been looked at before. Yeah. And, and that, well, actually, he was a geophysicist. Geophysicist. Um, yes. Xavier Le Pichon, and he, uh, in the 1960s was one of, he's like the father of plate tectonics. Yeah. Um, and he, um, he is also a person with a deep Catholic faith who has spent, who raised his family in part in communities of care, communities where um, people with mental illness or disabilities lived in community with others. So he has practiced compassion in an intense way. Were and these he, the Larch communities? Yeah, Larch, he's connected yeah. to Larch. He, um, one of the things that plate tectonics revealed is that growth and change that is more or less peaceful, um, fertility, generativity, actually comes through weaknesses gracefully expressed. Um, and honoring weakness. And where there is rigidity, that's where you need, uh, you know, kind of violent, where, where it takes violence for there to be change. And he s sees the same thing in human communities. And um, he says, you know, we often tell the story of like how humanity developed, what, how we became human, what distinguishes us from right. other creatures. Yeah. And he looks at something like, you know, the, this evidence at the Neanderthals, that there were skeletons found that completely flies in the face of the kind of survival of the fittest idea of who we are, yeah. who humans are, uh, that very disfigured, disabled people lived long lives, which means that they would have needed an extraordinary amount of care in communities that were struggling just to survive. He talks about how we, um, we tell the story of how, how we became human through how, when we develop tools. Right, the right? milestones. When we develop tools, that yeah, the mi that's it. Yes. The milestones are when do we build fire and when right. do we make tools, and of course that's important. But he said, you know, a, a hallmark of humanity is this extraordinary um, care that is given to the young and to the weak and to the vulnerable. I mean, that's, that's what other creatures don't do. And that that, in fact, is what makes us human, humane. And the, he's French, and he said those two words are the same in French. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it connects very nicely to something that you identified in, in speaking with um, a professor of, of Bible about the word for compassion in Hebrew, in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, yes. Of being the, the, it's rachamim, and rachum being uh, also the word for the womb. Yes, and in Arabic also the yes. same. The root of compassion yes. in the word, uh, in the word, the word for the womb. And there was a, a connection, another a part that, uh, of the of the writing that the the longer the period of helplessness of the children, the yes. greater the com capacity for compassion becomes. Yes, yes. So it it was a new development um, in our species. In, the, in, in apes, but then much more in he, Neanderthals and humans, that there's this long period of gestation and that the young are born utterly helpless, right. that we are dependent on care and connection to live from the beginning of our lives, and that this long period that is required to raise our young actually awakens these, these capacities in us to be caring, 
to be creative, uh, to create community, um, to find um, that life uh, becomes meaningful and becomes joyful and purposeful when we understand our well-being to be linked to that of others. Um, and that's where that, that connection of the womb, you know, that is the ultimate connection. But I remember when I was sitting with uh, Walter Brueggemann, who's a, who's a scholar of the, of the prophets, the biblical prophets, and uh, I, I said, oh, that's such a beautiful metaphor, right? <laughs> and he said, he said, he said something like, well, actually, if you think about childbirth, it's a little more complicated than that. And I said, and I know that better than you do. <laughs> right, right. And actually, I love that. Yeah. That's so important, that that metaphor tells the whole messy, beautiful story. Right. Um, and then I think the story of compassion writ large and the real challenge of, our century, of this century where we are actually connected where our well-being is, in fact, our survival and our flourishing, in fact, are linked to the well-being of strangers around the world. So, you know, to ex can we extend what we know in our circles of care, our circles of family and tribe, to wider and wider circles of strangers? I think that is the measure of how we continue to grow into our humanity in this next chapter of our species. Which is a huge challenge it's for us. It's a huge us. challenge. And, and I'm wondering how, how that connects with, connects with the idea that, that you present or that is, and, and that others that you've spoken with present that change occurs on the margins and not in the chaotic center. Yeah. Um, and that there were several places in the book where this theme came back again. There were, digital tribes that were spoken about yeah. uh, by uh, uh, Popova, Maria? Maria Popova, uh, brain picking. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, and, uh, and certainly uh, Jean uh, Vernier yes. uh, of the Arche, Larche communities. Yes. Yes. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that and how, how these um, change agents see things happening and are a part of this, this change that, that does have a global consequence but it's not happening in ways that we would expect it. And somebody else used a phrase that um, it's uh, critical yeast, not critical, critical yeast. mass. Yes, right? yes. There's a lot of that question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so it should take um, us till about 10 o'clock. <laughs> That's right. Well, well, one place I would start is, uh, so years ago, I interviewed a Joan Chittister, who's a Benedictine nun, and she's just a great, you know, people have said if there were female bishops in the, Roman Catholic Church in our lifetime, which there will not be, she would be one. Yeah. Um, she's a really powerful woman. And so she says, you know, in fifth, sixth century Rome, um, the New York Times of, of, of ancient Rome n did not carry a headline that said, Benedict writes rule. <laughs> um, right. Right. There was this little thing happening where this this, this person, who we now know as St. Benedict, uh, wanted to create community in a new way, religious community and contemplative community. I think he created like 12 communities of 12 men or 10 communities of 10 men in his lifetime. That one of the for early communities he created, they tried to poison him, right? He was not popular, right. he was not a success. Yeah. <laughs> and yet this was the thing that a thousand years later, literally keeps Western civilization alive. This monastic tradition that literally preserved um, learning and knowledge, um, a, whole, a whole genre of learning and knowledge. Um, and I take great comfort and hope in that story. I believe that you know everybody in this room is privileged in some way. We're privileged to be able to you know be in this beautiful space, to, you know, to, to have this conversation on a Wednesday night. And so many people here are doing amazing things. And you know, I'm interviewing some of the wisest people in the world. But I don't think we probably we do not know what is happening today, somewhere quietly, that is going to keep civilization alive 100 years from now or 1,000 years from now. And that's great, right? Um, 
So, yeah, so, so, I mean, that's the basic idea. I think a lot about how, uh, I mean, I will say I read the New York Times Sunday newspaper. I actually don't read the paper every day anymore, but I read the Sunday paper religiously. But it's only been in just the last two or three years or five years that I looked at that slogan, all the news that's fit to print, and thought, how ridiculous. Right? Why have we not been laughing? Right, right. And it is, it's, it's the best of its kind. But the truth is, as we are kind of waking up to um, the news, um, journalism as we've known it, the ways we have to tell the story of our time, they're so incomplete. And um, also, what I've heard from so many wise people with a long view of time is that change, this idea of the margins, that change always starts in the margins. Um, like St. Benedict. Um, people who are doing something truly new that nobody has quite thought of that way before or done that way before are not going to be welcomed with open arms precisely because it's new and strange. It will seem strange, uh, but they get on with it. And actually, I think one of the miraculous emboldening things about this age and our technology um, you know, we, we do a lot of hand-wringing about the dangers of our technology, and that's real too. But the power our technology has to allow us to, to, to work on the part of the world that we can see and touch, to be in our very particular local space, um, you know, to heal, the, to repair the world, right. like the world we can see and touch, whatever that means, however small that seems. But then this fascinating thing is happening where technology then has, an, has a capacity to amplify what is local in particular. So we learn things in our neighborhoods and we can send that out. So that's fascinating. The, the critical yeast idea, which is connected to that, um, one of my favorite thinkers who's in the book is a, a peacemaker, a conflict resolution expert, John Paul Lederach. And um, he says, we have in our heads, um, so I think this, the question uh, that really fascinates me is how does social change happen? Right. And how does social change happen in the 21st century? And it's not the same as the 20th century. And we're, we're, still, we're, just, we're just actually, we're in the dark with right. that question. Wait, think about Black Lives Matter. Yes. It's very much a 21st century. Beginning with century. a hashtag. Yeah. Right, a movement that begins with a hashtag. Right. But Black Lives Matter is also trying to figure out you know, how does that evolve as a right. movement? Right. And it's not going to be the March on Washington, no. right? But, but, but that, most of us are still operating with a sense of a social movement, social change, uh, happens with large numbers of people on the streets, um, an identifiable charismatic leader. That's an interesting thing about Black Lives Matter too, because they, there are leaders, but it's not, you know, they're not out front. No. Um, and so John Paul Lederach says, well, that is critical mass. And that is, and he says, you know, when there is wide, you know, large scale change, there are moments when, um, when, when, when what happens are large numbers of bodies on the streets, the charismatic leader, and that, you, you need that often to, to uproot structures mm -hmm. that need uprooting. But, but for long term transformation, the creation of new realities, uh, preceding those bodies on the street and after those bodies on the street, he says what is actually important is critical yeast. Mm -hmm. And that happens over long periods of time. And it, it has at its core uh, uh, a quality of relationship in unlikely combinations of people. Um, and like uh, Joan Chittister's analogy of not seeing Benedict. I love that metaphor of critical yeast mm. because we can all become critical yeast right now. Right, right, right. That, that's very much a part of the capacity that we have. Um, in, you share an interview with uh, Francis Kissling, uh, who says that the hallmark of civil debate, which is something that we are so desperately in need of today in particular, yeah that it's, it's when you can acknowledge 
that which is good in the position of the person you disagree with, um, and that you need courage to be vulnerable in front of those we passionately disagree with. Yeah. Um, and this resonates very strongly, again, from Jewish tradition with two first century teachers, Hillel and Shammai, um, who were known for engaging in these intense debates with mm. one another. Um, but what is said about those debates is that they were done for the sake of heaven. That is, that they understood in each other and they f saw the good that they were arguing with the same end goal in mind. Mm -hmm. And that the reason why we follow the teachings of Hillel is because he would always place the argument of Shammai first when presenting a position. That according that kind of respect and that love of this person with whom he disagreed and showing even a little bit of vulnerability of saying, yeah. I'm going to teach this position. And that you had mentioned that in, in the book, that you wanted to live in that crack, that place, right? Um, right. And make that, that place wider. What is it that Francis says, uh, the crack in the middle? Where people it? on both sides absolutely refuse to see the other as evil. Right. Right. And you say, that's, that's the place where you want to live. Yeah. 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 And so she was the um, head of Catholics for Choice. She was called the abortion queen. She is a passionate pro-choice activist. But when she retired from Catholics for Choice, she decided that the adventure she wanted to embark on um, was to find out what it would mean to be in real relationship with her political opposites. It wasn't about finding common ground or right. you know, changing their minds or having her mind change. She, she knew where her passion lay. But she wanted to know how relationship would change the dialogue and perhaps the trajectory. Yes. Um, you know, so one of the things she learned is that you, that it actually forces you to get vulnerable. Mm -hmm. One reason that that's, you know, unimaginable in our political or our public life right now, certainly our political life, um, you, you know, um, we we have to we would have to or we we can, and we can but we we would have to create spaces where where that kind of vulnerability is uh reasonable right and um and that safe safety yeah, it's in, yeah yeah where it where it would i mean because it's it actually would be stupid to be vulnerable in a lot of our public and political and that's not, and that's not i don't think we're called to be stupid right um, but I think we have to understand that if we want a different kind of dialogue, um, we, we really have to diverge. We have to create some new realities, some new places, uh, which, which do have some trustworthiness. I think uh, Parker Palmer is a big uh, mentor to me. He's a Quaker author and educator. And he, he says this interesting thing that um, we're very comfortable and, and skilled in this culture at bringing our intellect into our public spaces. We know how to wield our opinions. You know? um, we've also gotten pretty good at bringing our emotions and articulating our emotions in public spaces. But he says um, the, soul, the soul is a different, it's, a, it's another place in us. And that for the insights of the soul to speak its truth, it needs quiet, inviting, and trustworthy spaces. And I read that, uh, or maybe I, I mean, I sat with Parker early on in my adventure, and uh, every time I start a conversation, um, you know, this happens before words are exchanged. This, this again, is in the thin creation of a space. I try to create a, a quiet, inviting, and trustworthy conversational space, media space. Um, and, th and that re needs some effort. Uh, so yeah, so we we and and I do love I think those two questions that Francis names I've, I've found them to be very useful for people and they're wonderful. It's a wonder these are wonderful like practical tools um, if you can create that space where vulnerability is uh, reasonable. Um, can you get to the point where uh, you can articulate what it is uh, that you can find to admire in the other? position. And what in your own position gives you pause? Uh, it, it's unimaginable that our presidential candidates w would feel safe right. to articulate either of those things. Yeah, it, we would not, and we would not reward them for it. No, they'd be hammered. So, so, and I think, you know, we, ha we, we cannot, um, 
we cannot limit our imaginations about what's possible uh, based on what's possible in our political spaces and certainly the presidential election. Right. We have to get on with this, right? We have to start having the conversations we want to be hearing and we have to let that play itself out however it will. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And this is something that we, we know very, very deeply and you talk about you know, vulnerability and the pressure for perfection are at odds in our, in our world. Um, and uh, you do bring forward, oh my goodness, um, how are we doing? <laughs> okay, so um, you bring forward uh, a, a poem, uh, and I just, I want to get this right, which is why I put these is beautiful... Is it Father Killian's poem? Be beautiful, yes it is. I love that yeah. so much. Do, will yes. you read it? Yes, uh, I just want to say who, so Father Killian McDonald, actually, uh, so he was the He's a Benedictine monk, and he was the founder of this ecumenical institute that really first got me going on this. I consider it a seedbed for my project. Um, he was, he grew up in South Dakota. He says uh, it was not the end of the world, but you could see it from there, a small <laughs> town in South Dakota. And uh, he became this kind of, he became this ecumenical leader kind of accidentally back when, and this is back when ecumenism Back when, let's say in the early 60s, when it was absolutely radical for Catholics and Protestants to be talking to right. each other, much less to add Jews to the equation. Yeah. And actually that kind of thing is really important for us to take in, that, that there, there is so much change happening at any given moment and we, we, can't, we, you know, we don't remember that. Right. Change happens slow and it also happens fast. It's happening at these different paces. Anyway, Father Killian in his 70s, then became a poet, and he has become quite an accomplished um, published poet. And this is, this is my favorite of his poems. Perfection, perfection. I have had it with perfection. I have packed my bags. I am out of here, gone. As certain as rain will make you wet, perfection will do you in. It droppeth not as dew upon the summer grass to give liberty and green joy. Perfection straineth out the quality of mercy, withers rapture at its birth. Before the battle is half begun, begun, cold probity thinks it can't be won, concedes the war. I've handed in my notice, given back my keys, signed my severance check, I quit. <laughs> Hints I could have taken. Even the perfect chiseled form of Michelangelo's radiant David squints. The Venus de Milo has no arms. The Liberty Bell is cracked. <laughs> I, I sent him the book yeah. last week. Yeah. And I know that he's having some health problems. He's 92. And I sent him an email. And I know is he's still an email. And I said, Father Killian, I just want you to know I put one of your poems in the book. And he wrote me back. He sent me an email back. He said something like, how sweet of you to, to send this to an old man who wobbles as he walks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm just so, so struck because the themes of vulnerability mm. um, run throughout the book and are mm. such an important and powerful piece and that the, um, the sense of how we get to wholeness or wholeheartedness yes. is actually through brokenness and broken heartedness yes. and and there's actually a in our, our tradition the um, the Kutzker Rebbe who is a Hasidic 19th century Hasidic teacher um, said that there is uh, nothing so whole as a broken heart yeah and and I just think it's such a, a powerful piece for us in, in thinking about how it is that we admit vulnerability recognizing that in each other in ourselves first and then in each other um, you wrote uh, you know, there's so many, oh my goodness, there's so many things that are, the book really is marvelous and you really <laughs> should read it. It is, it is just filled with, with so much and I wanted to just, I, I, I didn't want to stop without talking about love mm. and uh, a few things that, that you have learned uh, in, in this. Okay, the, the, the title of that chapter is Love, A Few Things I've Learned. Yes, exactly. Because I, I knew I had to write about love and I was having real trouble getting going. 
and I and then it was only when I like renamed the chapter and it was like and not like love this is a chapter about love but love a few things I've learned and then I could start writing right <laughs> so so what are a few things that that you have that you have learned um uh well, love is, you know, love is the pinnacle. It's, it's the great, great, the virtue of all virtues. And love uh, crosses the chasms between us, and it brings them into relief. Uh, it is the hardest work. It is the most essential work. Um, uh, one thing I've learned as much in my personal life as, as in my conversations, I've learned to uh, honor the many kinds of love. And I've realized how we kind of work with an impoverished imagination about love. We, we tend to talk about in love right. and uh, erotic love and chemistry. And that is certainly an animating feature of human life. But there are so many forms of love. And I, you know, after my divorce, I, I, I talk about, uh, you know, building a very rich life for myself with my children and my friends, and yet walking around thinking and saying to people, you know, I, yes, wonder, my life is good, but I don't have love in my life. And then one day realizing I was using this absolutely pivotal word in a careless way. And in, in the way I was using that word and imagining it, I was creating a sense of scarcity in the midst of abundance. Right. Um, and I guess the other important thing, and I'm glad you want to talk about this, because it's a really important part of the book to me, is um, my desire that we, um, I think love is the only thing big enough f for the challenges we have before right. us. But we have to figure out what that can mean as something robust and muscular and reality-based and practical in public life. And it sounds like crazy language, I think. It, it sounds wishy-washy, maybe. But you know what? We have, we have introduced the question of hate into legal code, right? right? We have created a legal category where we have acknowledged that the virtue of to tolerance wears out and the worst of the human condition rushes in. People who have shifted the world on its axis, Martin Luther King Jr. is one of them, have called us to love. That's the part of his message that is unfinished. Right. That's the business we have to do now. Uh, and yeah, so I... Um, that's on my mind. That how do we how do we um, you know figure out what it means? Uh, you know, could, can we hold if we can hold the question of hate, if we can acknowledge the reality of hate, can we hold the question of love? Can we acknowledge the reality of love and fill it with practicality? Right. right. And the, the the rabbis love to play the game. Uh, what's the the greatest command in all of the Torah. Out of the 613 commandments that are in the five books of Moses, what's the greatest one? And one, one teacher says it is from Leviticus uh, chapter 19, love your neighbor as yourself. Right? And, and then there's a whole discussion of what, is, what does that possibly mean? First of all, how can you command love? Right? Yeah. And the other is love your neighbor as yourself. How is that even possible? And yet it's, that's exactly what it says. And to find those ways to be able to express that kind of, what is that love that's being expressed? Clearly not romantic love, yeah. and, but there's something else that's, that's there that's necessary. And, and that part of it too is that we live in a culture where people don't love themselves. Yes. Right? And that that's, yeah. the, that's a beginning yes. point for yes. so many is yes. that they can't treat another um, as, as a partner in love because they don't feel that for themselves. Yeah. Right? And that's another real gift that we have to work with in this century is we have so much sophistication now about self-knowledge, about health, about wellness, about grounding ourselves in our bodies. Um, you know, there's this Buddhist term, uh, oh, what's it called? Mental hygiene, right? right? Um, uh, I, I think we are, we are, we are, we have science and we have habits to get mental hygiene right. And in fact, 
you know, to this point, uh, mental hygiene, kind of basic sanity, basic clarity of mind, wellness, we, we probably have always needed to plumb the depths of our traditions. Um, and I think we have tools for that like we have never had before. Yeah. So we, we really may have the capacity to live into, you know, to live the midrash of what does love mean? What does love your neighbors yourself mean? Um, that adventure and to make it real. I know that we have questions also. Thank you, Lonnie, for being patient. And